The Bible is filled with exhortations to fear God. When the word fear is used specifically with reference to God, it covers a wide range of meanings, from being afraid of divine punishment to standing in awe of the Lord. In other words, the word can be used in a positive or negative sense, depending on the context. For example, when God came down upon Mount Sinai to give his people the Ten Commandments, there was thunder, lightning, the sound of a ram's horn, and smoke all around. This made the Israelites tremble and stand far away from what was happening. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. In this case, Moses did not use two different words for fear, but he referred to two kinds of fear. The first, which Moses told them not to have, was one that drove them away from God. In fact, they felt so unworthy that they thought they would die if God spoke to them. However, the positive fear of God which Moses referred to and encouraged was one that would keep the people from sinning against God. Samuel also delivered a similar message to the Israelites when they felt guilty over asking for a king. Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Only fear the Lord. Like Moses, Samuel told the Israelites not to turn aside from God because of their fear, but to actually turn towards him and serve him. While running and hiding from God may be our natural tendency when we have disobeyed his commands, this is not how God intended for us to fear him. Instead, the fear that God wants us to have is related to seeking him, confessing our guilt, and obeying his commands. More than that, God desires for all people to revere him, respect him, hallow his name, and honor him. As it says in Revelation 15 verses 3 and 4, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. When we fear God, our worship and attitude towards him should be filled with wonder and praise. We should be humbled by his awesome presence. We should also feel that all glory and honor belong to him as we ponder upon his holiness, justice, and righteousness. So the fear of the Lord begins with knowing who he is and is followed by recognizing that he is worthy to be feared and glorified. Scripture tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. This tells us that the fear of the Lord is the key to knowing God and what pleases Him. Knowing these things grants us true wisdom and understanding. Without the fear of the Lord, we would not be able to understand the will of God. Neither would we have the power to depart from evil and do what is right according to God's commandments. The fear of the Lord compels us not to sin against Him. But those who do not fear God indulge in wickedness and have no reason to refrain from evil. The Lord, however, hates all things that are evil. Therefore, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Not only that, but the fear of the Lord is about seeking God's favor and wanting to be well-pleasing and acceptable to Him. It means having a profound measure of respect for God in that we deeply regard what He approves and disapproves of. While this signifies a strong sense of caution, this is not only because we don't want to offend God, but because we want to be sensitive, considerate, and mindful towards Him, which is also part of what it means to fear the Lord. We do this in close human relationships too, because love is tied to respect. The fear of the Lord is not a hidden quality or inner feeling of piety that comes and goes. Rather, it is a principle and continuous attitude by which we live. When the fear of God rules in our hearts, we will always be conscientious of keeping His commandments and doing His will. Therefore, it's practical, it's part of our identity, and it affects every aspect of our lives, from our speech and conduct to our habits and behaviors, and even our relationships with other people. 
Those in the Bible who were known as God-fearing were often described as being righteous, upright, and blameless. Cornelius, for example, was a devout man who continuously feared the Lord, prayed unceasingly to him, did many charitable works, and was well spoken of by the whole nation of the Jews. He didn't do any of these things to show people that he feared God. Rather, they were byproducts of his fear of God, which was already his fundamental way of living. The fear of the Lord can also determine the actions and choices we make in life. It reveals our trust and faith in God. Without the fear of the Lord, would Abraham have been able to offer his only son Isaac to the Lord? Likewise, would Noah have moved with reverent fear to prepare an ark without seeing what he had been divinely warned of? No. They became examples of faith because of their fear of God. So fearing God is the basis of our relationship with Him and the foundation of our faith. If we didn't believe in God, we wouldn't need to fear Him at all. But because we believe that He is the creator and ruler of the universe, we ought to fear Him in every sense of the word, from being terrified of His greatness to being in awe of His majesty. To fear the Lord is to not only recognize that God is worthy of the highest honor, but to give that honor to Him. So how can we apply this to our lives? The next time we feel wronged or mistreated by someone, let us stop for a moment and think about how we can fear the Lord through our actions. We may want to fight back or avenge ourselves, but this wouldn't be right. But would we stop ourselves only because we are afraid that God will punish us if he is not pleased with our actions? Or that things will only become worse if God is not on our side? This shouldn't be the case. Our motivation for not repaying evil for evil should be due to our faith that God sees and understands everything we encounter, and that he is the judge and he's in control of what happens to us. When we respect God in this way, we are able to gather strength and wisdom from him to do good to those who hate us and pray for those who persecute us. The next time we are tempted to think or watch anything that is impure, let us stop for a moment and think about how we can fear the Lord through our thoughts and actions. We may tell ourselves that it's not a big deal or it won't affect our spiritual lives, but this wouldn't be right. But would we stop ourselves only because we will feel guilty for having unholy thoughts? Or because we are afraid that God will not abide with us if we keep on giving in to our sinful desires? This may be one way to fear the Lord and to do what's right, but God desires us to live a holy life, both in terms of what we do and what we think. Therefore, a better motivation for us to resist temptation would be to honor God by presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him.